Well, good evening and welcome to the fall 2011 Paul C. Wilt Phi Kappa Phi Lecture. I'm David Newton and I'm the president of our Westmont chapter of Phi Kappa Phi. My two colleagues, Dr. Sherry Larson Heckley and uh, Dr. Brenda Smith serve respectively in the post of vice president and uh, president-elect and then uh, Brenda serves as our secretary. Since its founding in 1897, Phi Kappa Phi remains the nation's oldest, largest, and most selective collegiate honor society for all academic disciplines, with chapters on more than 300 campuses in the US, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, and over 1 million members worldwide. Westmont's very proud to support an active chapter for events for students and faculty scholars, including our fall and spring lecture series, which is named in honor of longtime history professor Dr. Paul Wilt, who's here in the front row this evening. Hello, Paul. Welcome. We're glad you're here. He inspired literally thousands of students during his 35 years of teaching here at Westmont. And since his retirement, Paul has continued to serve Westmont in researching and cataloging the college's archives, producing wonderful and inspiring narratives dating back to Westmont's founding almost 75 years ago in 1937. Paul, we're grateful to have you here this evening. Tonight's lecture is titled, Loving the Poor, Saving the Rich, Almsgiving and Salvation in Early Christianity. It's by Helen Ree. Dr. Ree is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in History at Berkeley and her MDiv and PhD at Fuller. Her first book came out in 2005 from Routledge. The title was Early Christian Literature, Christ and Culture in the Second and Third Centuries. She's now working on a new book, titled Loving the Poor, Saving the Rich, Wealth, Poverty, and Early Christian Formation. And tonight's lecture comes from her current research and writing in this area. As she examines early Christian attitudes and practices regarding wealth and poverty, and how these contributed to shaping Christian identities within larger Greco-Roman cultures. Dr. Rhee will speak for 45 minutes, and then two respondents will each have seven minutes to further reflect on this topic. Our first respondent is my colleague from the Economics and Business Department, Dr. Ed Knoll, who is currently in his second tour of duty as department chair. Dr. Knoll has done his undergraduate degree at Texas Tech. He has an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin and his PhD in economics from LSU. And our second respondent is Telford Work, and uh, he's also from Dr. Ree's RS department. And uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Stanford, his MA at Fuller, and his PhD in theology and ethics from Duke. So without further ado, let's please welcome Dr. Helen Ray. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for here. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to deliver this lecture to uh, my distinguished colleagues and students and the guests of Westmont community. Uh, let me first pose the sort of the issue of this lecture and uh, set the context for you. Please bear with me and uh, uh, I think this is the important part of actually my lecture as well. So. The majority of early Christian texts overwhelmingly affirm salvation by Jesus' atonement through his unique sacrifice. One of the most eloquent apologies in the early church proclaims the once for all and irreplaceable redemptive work of God through Christ in soaring exuberance and awe. Placed in your seat is the handout, a list of quotes. So if you can follow the quote number one there from the Epistle of Diogenetus. He, God, himself in mercy, took him, Christ, our sins, himself gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for the wicked, the innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust. For what else could cover our sins but his righteousness? In whom was it possible for us, wicked and impious as we were, to be justified except in the Son of God alone? O oh, the sweet exchange, O oh, work of God beyond all searching out, 
that the wickedness of many should be hidden in one righteous man, and the righteousness, righteousness of the one should justify many wicked. This kind of acclamation belonged to an emerging mainstream Christian thought of sufficiency of salvation in Jesus Christ's life, atoning death, and resurrection, which replaced the Jewish sacrificial law and temple. On the other hand, one cannot help but recognize nearly universal calls to almsgiving for the purpose of forgiveness of sins in the early church, which reflects the traditional Jewish piety and its Christian contextualization. For instance, the ancient homily called Second Clement, especially Second Clement 16, 16, 4, explicitly links 1 Peter 4, 8 to almsgiving, and then almsgiving to pardon of sin. Quote number two in your handout. Almsgiving is good as is repentance from sin. Fasting is better than prayer, while almsgiving is better than both. And love covers a multitude of sins. That's First Peter 4, 8. Almsgiving relieves the burden of sin. End of quote. The early church manual uh, did appear, also commands the Christ followers, quote number three, if you acquire something with your hands, give it as a ransom for your sins. End of quote. Polycarp, the revered bishop of Smyrna in the mid second century, exhorted the Philippians not to put off doing good when they were able, since, quote, giving to charity almsgiving frees a person from death. Quoting uh, Tobit, Jewish Apocrypha, Tobit 4.10. Another second century document called the Shepherd of Hermes attempted to address the dual issue of the problem of the post-baptismal sin and of the social conflict between, between the rich and the poor. Hermes' solution was allowing single repentance for post-baptismal sin and exhorting single-mindedness, especially for the rich, which required cutting away their wealth through almsgiving to the poor. It would result in the great exchange and symbiosis between the rich and the poor. As the rich, uh, as the rich meet the material needs of the poor through alms, the poor would uh, intercede for the salvation of the rich. By the time of Bishop Cyprian of Carthage in the mid-third century, this notion of almsgiving affecting salvation of the givers would secure its place in a theological trajectory and practical ministries. In the fourth century and onward, this redemptive almsgiving would be one of the most consistent elements and tradition in the sermons and teachings of the church fathers. Therefore, some scholars as Roman Garrison, uh, such as Roman Garrison, contends that the early church compromised the exclusive role of Jesus' death as the unique and sufficient means of atonement by adopting and developing the doctrine of redemptive almsgiving for the post-baptismal sin. Here is another marvelous exchange extolled by Clement of Alexandria. Quote number four in your handout. What splendid trading, what divine business. You buy incorruption with money. You give the perishing things of the world and receive in exchange for them an eternal abode in heaven compass the whole earth if need be. Spare not dangers or toils that here you may buy a heavenly kingdom. End of quote. Now this exchange of almsgiving and salvation seems incompatible with the formal exchange of Christ's atoning death and salvation. Even an egregious violation of the exclusive divine work of atonement which would present a serious theological departure from and challenge to the gospel message. The main reason for this compromise in conflict with Jesus' expiatory death in Garrison's view has to do with a crisis in faith provoked by post-baptismal sins, which in turn was incited by the delay of Perusia, um, typically the return of Christ, as it is understood. Implied in this contention is that there took place a momentous shift in patristic soteriology from focusing on the work of Christ to focusing rather on human work, however much that could be justified by the unexpected social and contextual change. 
Now, this issue of redemptive almsgiving reveals one of the thorny theological problems that arose in the sociology of the early church. That was not poverty, but wealth, in light of the gospel's apparent preferential option for the poor and harsh treatment of the rich. The theological problem of wealth especially pertained to the salvation of its possessors, possessors, excuse me, namely the wealthy, in relation to those who were in want of it, the poor. Has the early church really turned away from the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ's atoning death on the cross and set up an unfortunate trajectory in the centuries to come, only to be corrected by the Protestant reformers in the 16th century? This lecture examines how early Christians' understanding of and practice involving wealth and poverty, namely almsgiving, influenced and was in turn influenced by the developing doctrine of salvation within their concrete social and historical context. So I will first engage uh, this issue um, by focusing on a few particular yet representative texts um, by a Greek Eastern father and then a Latin Western father in their socio-historical and theological context. So first, um, salvation, the rich and the poor in Clement of Alexandria. In the late second century, Clement of Alexandria, the educated and cultured apologist and theologian, wrote a pastoral homily called, Who is a Rich Man That is Saved? The title itself is telling, isn't it? Uh, addressed to the affluent and cultured Christian audience in Alexandria, like Clement himself, in this work, Salvation of the Rich, who could identify with the rich young man in Mark 10, emerges as a considerable theological and social challenge that needs to be reinterpreted and reapplied. To the rich man's quest for eternal life, Jesus apparently demanded dispossession of his wealth and ultimately declared the virtual impossibility of the rich entering the kingdom of God as the rich. Is there hope for the rich? If so, how can they be saved? Clement approaches the salvation of the rich out of a pastoral concern and directs his message not to those rich who are uninitiated in the truth, but to the rich who have learned the Savior's power and his splendid salvation. From the outset, Clement acknowledges that the salvation seems to be more difficult for the rich than for the poor but he wants to show the same concerned rich who have already been initiated into the salvation process that how that which is impossible with men becomes possible with Christ's instruction of truth and their good works in lifelong perseverance. Hence, Clement first unfolds the truth of Christ's teaching in Mark 10, 17 to 31, with his figurative interpretation, and then guides the audience in how their good works would secure their salvation. So for Clement, the truth of Christ's instructions to the rich man lies in their hidden meaning, which can be found with an effort of mind. The Lord's truth is first and foremost to know God and the Savior. That is the greatest doctrine, which requires perfection beyond the observance of the Mosaic law. The rich man's fulfillment of the law was good, but not perfect. Eternal life is beyond the reach of the law, however. Knowing the Savior and eternal life entails inner contemplation, not an outer act. Therefore, Christ's counsel of perfection to the rich man, that is, to sell his possessions does not mean an external act of divestment, but rather inner uh, detachment, that is, to strip the soul itself and the will of their lurking passions and utterly to root out and cast away all alien thoughts from the mind. If the Savior's words were to be taken literally, there are no more than an extension of the law, which is external, and therefore no life-giving and no more than a reiteration of what the Greek philosophers have already done prior to his coming. So Christ's teaching must be more divine and more perfect, new and unique, superseding all human teachings before him. 
Thus, it cannot mean the literal renunciation of wealth, which points to mere natural human capacity. Clement then shows how the external acts of renunciation contradict Christ's other commandments, such as making for, our, uh, making for ourselves friends with mammon of unrighteousness, that's Luke 16, 9, storing treasures in heaven, Matthew 6, 20, feeding the hungry and giving drinks to the thirsty, Matthew 25, and so on. All of these commandments presuppose personal wealth beyond bare necessities of life, which a believer should share with the less fortunate, especially when the Lord threatens eternal punishment to those who do not obey them. Thus the commandments like these reveal intrinsic neutrality and necessity of wealth and correctly highlights this proper utility and instrumentality with right reason and judgment rather than its simplistic abandonment. In this context, Clement, using uh, Stoic vocabulary and principle, places wealth in the external realm of adiaphora, things morally indifferent but potentially advantageous depending on their use. Neither receiving inheritance nor saving wealth with frugality and investing property prior to conversion are morally suspect. Rather, he relates these kinds of wealth to the gracious gift of God, who in his providence distributes fortune to people. Make no mistake, Clement acknowledges that visible wealth is perilous, beggarly, transitory, and alien to the soul, and easily leads the soul astray to luxuries and fancy allurements. Wealth, like a snake, twisting, twisting in the grasp, whether experienced or not, can cling to the hand and bite, unless a man rises superior to it and uses it with discretion. Nonetheless, what is important is how, the, uh, is how the rich should use wealth to their spiritual advantage and for the benefit of their neighbors. We'll come back to this point a little bit later. Since Christ's truth regarding salvation does not depend upon outward things but on soul's virtue, purging oneself of the soul's passions is the key to entering the kingdom of God. The external nature of salvation demands cultivating pure and passionless souls with God's help and not reading of external goods and possessions. Cultivating pure and passionless souls is an external part of the care of the self that involves continual vigilance, education, training, and discipline in curbing vices of desires, passions, and immoderation. Elsewhere, Clement presents Christian salvation more explicitly as a two-stage sp uh, two spiritual and ethical process of self-care. First, a struggle, with the a, a struggle with and care of a cure of pleasure, passion, and desire through purification and self-control. And eventually, moving on to the second, a perfect state of passionless contemplation and imitation of God where the uh, snares and traps of desire are no longer danger to the soul. With baptism, every believer embarks on a long, arduous, and upward journey of healing of passions, and an, uh, and an advanced baptized believer should grow and develop to reach the perfect state. As Harry Meyer aptly puts it, for Clement, quote, the redeemed self is engaged in a life and death struggle with the old sinful self of the passions and cultivates freedom by applying the law and the Christ's truth. And this struggle itself testifies to the salvation of the self. So even the rich then can enjoy the object of their hope, that is salvation, with settled purpose and hard training and exercises led by Christ the instructor and guide. Hence, in this struggle and race of salvation, it is certainly possible for the rich to cast off inner laws and passions without literal dispossession. Clement writes, because Christ does not envy their wealth, whereas only those who are controlled and overcome by their wealth should leave them. In fact, 
The literal renunciation of wealth does not actually cure the disease of the soul. Instead, it could rather create a double annoyance, the absence of means of support and the presence of regret, simply due to basic human needs. Therefore, it could result in false pretension of cure, riddled with even greater passions and anguish. Both voluntary and involuntary poverty has no intrinsic value apart from the attendant poverty of the soul, which is available for the rich as well as for the poor. This internalization of salvation demystifies the traditional assumption of the pious poor and the wicked rich and spiritualizes wealth and poverty. As Clement deconstructs the pious poor and the wicked rich tradition, he constructs a model of the pious rich and the wicked rich on the one hand, and the noble poor and the wretched poor on the other. The pious rich are the ones who are rich in virtue and able to use every fortune in a holy and faithful manner. They are contrasted with the superior rich who are rich according to the flesh, but pursuing the life of transitory outward possessions. Likewise, the genuine poor are the ones who are poor in spirit with inner personal poverty, whereas the spurious poor consist of the poor in worldly goods, the outward alien poverty, but full of vices. Clement in this way connects the true pious rich with the genuine spiritual poor, and shows how the same man can be both poor and wealthy at the same time. Christ's call to sell one's possessions, then, is a universal call not only to the spiritual, uh, not only to the spurious outwardly rich, but also to the spurious outwardly poor to detach themselves from the alien possessions that dwell in their souls, in order that they may become pure in heart and may see God. This is indeed how one follows the Savior, that we seek after the Savior's sinlessness and perfection, adorning and regulating the soul before him as before a mirror, and arranging, in it, arranging it in every detail after his likeness. Again, salvation in this paradigm is a continuous upward progress toward perfection, which is passionless imitation of Christ, overcoming the insidious inner persecutions such as godless lust, manifold pleasures, and covetousness. Now, having established the truth of Christ's salvation, Clement then moves to how the rich can arrive at this state using their wealth. He first sets the theological ground for good works, especially almsgiving, in the greatest commandment of loving God. Just as knowing God is the foundation of Christ's truth, loving God is the foundation of Christ's love and our striving for good works. The second part of the greatest commandment is loving one's neighbor, neighbor as oneself. According to Clement's interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, our neighbor is none other than Christ himself, who showed us his mercy and heals our wounds of passions. How then do the rich love Christ as their neighbor as they love God? It is by loving Christ's disciples, fellow Christians in need. By giving relief to those Christians in need, the rich, fu uh, the rich fulfill the Lord's injunction to make friends with unrighteous mammon for their et eternal life, Luke 69. And it is how they secure their heavenly reward. In so doing, the rich should not just yield to a request or wait to be pastored, but they should, uh, they should personally seek out men whom they may benefit for their progress toward salvation, that is, the people who are worthy disciples of the Savior. Thus, Clement champions the salvific effect of almsgiving in the following way. That is the uh, same quote, quote number four. What splendid trading, what divine business, you buy incorruption with money. You give the perishing things of the world and receive in exchange for them an eternal abode in heaven. Compass the whole earth if need be. Spare not dangers or toils, that here you may buy a heavenly kingdom. End of quote. 
giving to the poor Christians promises a sure return of abundant reward and spiritual wealth to the rich to the extent that Clement freely uses an economic language of transaction and exchange, the notion that already heavily featured in the Shepherd of Hermes. However, Clement qualifies this great exchange. The rich, uh, the rich should see to it that, quote, the Lord did not say give or provide or benefit or help, but make a friend. Indeed, a friend is made not from one gift, but from complete relief and long companionship. Just as reading uh, uh, one's soul's passions takes a continual struggle and training, making friends with one's wealth takes a sustained work and building relationships with the recipients of their alms. Furthermore, in doing so, the rich should not try to distinguish the worthy from the unworthy poor, lest they accidentally neglect the worthy poor and incur eternal punishment by fire. They are also not to take offense at the appearance of the needy or to gaze them with contempt, for God and Christ dwell within the poor. What is necessary and important for the rich is to find those among the recipients who have power to save them with God, as they give to all who are enrolled as God's disciples, that is, the Christian poor in general. What is noteworthy is the fact that, contrary to his earlier effort to deconstruct the, deconstruct the tradition of the pious poor and the wicked rich in interiorizing and spiritualizing wealth and poverty, Clement presupposes and counts on that very tradition here in promoting redemptive almsgiving for the rich Christians. The pious poor's role is absolutely vital, and their spiritual services are both concrete and comprehensive. Quote, one is able to beg your life from God, another to hurt in you to when sick, another to weep and lament in sympathy on your behalf before the Lord. End of quote. Clement loses no time to issue the clearest call to the rich. Quote number five in your handout. Enrich on your behalf an army without weapons, without war, without bloodshed, an army of God-fearing old men, of God-beloved orphans, of widows armed with gentleness, of men adorned with love. Obtain with your wealth as guards for your body and for your soul such men as these, whose commander is God. Through them the sinking ship rises, steered by the prayers of saints alone, and the attack of robbers is made harmless, being stripped of his weapons by pious prayers. End of quote. If the one-time renunciation would not be a solution for the salvation of the rich, the ongoing generous almsgiving is a palpable way to obtain their salvation. For redemptive efficacy of almsgiving is rooted in the reciprocal exchange of love among believers, which is in turn rooted in God's love and a reciprocal demand of Christ's sacrifice. In this sense, almsgiving is a quintessential positive demonstration of loving God and neighbor, as well as of, as well as, uh, of using one's wealth properly. Despite an unabashed appeal to self-interest of the rich giver, a more fundamental appeal for almsgiving is love of God shown in Christ and love for God, without which no one can reach salvation. Because God receives and forgives everyone who turns to him in genuine repentance, and because everyone should demonstrate their repentance by deeds, as Acts 26.20 20 says, Almsgiving is an effective means of repentance and rooting out of, uh, rooting out of the soul the post-baptismal sins leading to death. For Clement, then, almsgiving, almsgiving becomes a necessary part of the care of the self, which is indispensable for the journey of salvation, the path to perfection, and which can never be achieved by a single act of external renunciation. The rich need and should utilize all the resources they can get to take care of their souls, God's power, human supplication, the help of brethren, sincere repentance, and constant practice. With all of these resources, success is achieved 
The Heavenly Father will give the earnest rich the true purification and unchanging life. Now we move to the western North Africa where we find Cyprian, the refined and charismatic bishop of Carthage in the mid-third century. Cyprian was an adult convert with a high birth, classical education, and significant resources, and he was familiar with sophisticated Roman elite culture in Carthage. The defining moments of Cyprian's episcopacy were first the persecution of Emperor Decius, which took place in 250 to 251, uh, and that caught the churches off guard and indeed demoralized them to internal chaos and crisis that escalated eschatological anxiety. And another moment of uh, Cyprian's episcopacy was second, the subsequent power struggles and controversies in his church regarding readmission of the lapsed, the fallen, especially the wealthy ones. Those events certainly impelled Cyprian to take a stricter stance on wealth and the wealthy on the one hand, and to articulate the redemptive almsgiving with a greater sense of urgency and theological import on the other. In his treatise written, uh, written at the end of the persecution on the lapsed, Cyprian saw the persecution, however evil and unjust that may be, as God's testing of his household that had been growing complacent in the years of peace. It was a heavenly wake-up call to their languid and sleeping faith. The church is failing in this persecution, that is, massive apostasy, especially of the wealthy. It revealed the true nature of our malady, which was a blind attachment to their patrimony. The cause of persecution, as Cyprian saw it, was primarily the faithful's insatiable greed and preoccupation with accumulating wealth to the, neglect of, uh, generous, uh, to the neglect of generous charity for the needy. During the persecution, the enforcement of the Decian edict that had ordered sacrifice to the gods with proof of certificates affected the rich and the poor in different ways. The wealthy elites might be subject to confiscation of property and exile minus torture. But the poor of the lower status, some of whom would, ha would have already been on the church's charity list prior to the persecution, they might be subject to torture or reduced to slavery. However, the poor would not attract the attention of the imperial authorities as much as the rich. Indeed, the rich elites were the more, uh, were, um, the more visible target of the authorities because of their socio-political position and properties. Nonetheless, the rich, sh uh, the rich should have confessed Christ by letting go of their properties and withdrawing to exile, Cyprian writes. Yet many wealthy Christians did not follow that expected course of action, but instead complied with the imperial edict. Some even rushed to the forum to sacrifice and thereby sought to protect their dependents and properties. Others avoided the actual act of sacrifice and therefore regarded themselves guiltless by purchasing forged certificates of, uh, certificates of sacrifice, either in person or by agents. Apparently, this was an attractive option because it was a clever way to keep their Christian commitment and to keep their properties and position or so they thought. <laughs> However, Cyprian considered such fictive certificates as confession of apostasy and regarded both groups, the sacrificers and the certified, as the lapsi, the apostates. Among the lapsi, some sought immediate reconciliation and readmission to the church through letters of peace granted by the confessors and martyrs. It was, done, uh, it was done based on their exalted status, that is, the confessors and martyrs. These are the ones who confess their faith in Christ during the persecution. So uh, based on their uh, exalt, uh, exalt, uh, exalted status and belief that those who suffer for Christ and because of their confession of faith 
they were thought to have been given a spiritual, a special anointing and power to obtain forgiveness directly from Christ with their intercession. And the majority of presbyters under Cyprian supported the lapses, uh, immediate reconciliation without penance, and urged those confessors to issue the certificates of peace against the will of Cyprian. And they urged those confessors to issue uh, the certificate of peace against will of Cyprian who admonished them to wait until the end of the persecution and who wanted to impose traditional penitential discipline on the lapsi and therefore to delay their reconciliation until the time of their death. Cyprian's stricter policy provoked these clergy who in fact had not supported Cyprian's Episcopal election two years earlier. And also it provoked the wealthy lapsi, both of them to lead an open rebellion and schism against Cyprian and his followers while he was still away in a hideout during the persecution. It seems that the reason or motivation behind this immediate reconciliation and readmission of the wealthy lapsi through the confessor's authority and merit was more than theological. Several scholars rightly suggest socioeconomic reasons for their push. The persecution hit the Carthaginian church not only morally but also financially because it was the wealthy in the church who had been major donors of charity and monthly support for clergy. With mass apostasy of the wealthy, the church was getting drained of its resources for caring for the needy, which was the most public ministry of the church, which should never be compromised, by the way. Um, the laxist clergy must have been concerned about this particular role of the wealthy lapsi, since the latter were not eligible to contribute to the care of the poor Christians unless they were formally reconciled. As Jeffrey Dunn notes, this laxist argument gained much sympathy and popularity in Carthage. Quote, the church needed the wealthy lapsi to be readmitted to communion quickly so that they could start making financial contribution to the care of the poor again. End of quote. Otherwise, the church would face a serious crisis in its ability to care for the needs of the steadfast poor, as well as the church clergy. Having lost the majority of wealthy members, this situation presented Cyprian too with a real challenge for not only overall unity of the church around the bishop, but also the maintenance of the support for the faithful poor and others. In this charged context, the true penance for reconciliation and thus for salvation of the lapsed, authorized by Cyprian, consisted mainly of almsgiving. Just as the Apostle Paul called the Gentiles to repent and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds, the wealthy lapsed as a sign of, uh, sign of their true repentance should apply themselves to the good deeds which can wash away their sins, be constant and generous in their giving alms, whereby souls are freed from death. Cyprian urged them to invest their earthly goods and riches with the Lord, their coming judge, as Cyprian urged them to give alms without delay and generously to make reparation for the guilt of sin, he promised that God could extend his mercy to them and turn back his judgment. In this new context, for Cyprian, almsgiving as lifelong penance provided an absolutely necessary condition for and with the reconciliation of the lapsed and their conspicuous almsgiving would be a means that should sustain the care of the poor in the financially strapped situation of his congregation. Thus, as William Countryman uh, fittingly expresses, for the wealthy, earthly riches offer the remedy for the very harm they caused. Unfortunately, a new calamity of dread, a dreadful plague swept through Carthage in summer of 252. 
it was another demoralizing blow to Christians who had just gone through the imperial persecution that a sense of normalcy for both Christians and pagans substantially broke down. Cyprian's treatise written in the midst of the play called On the, Alms, On the Works and Alms articulates a redemptive almsgiving in the strongest terms in light of that anxiety and pessimism of his congregants. Out of his great compassion, God himself labored for our salvation through the advent and death of his son Christ. But his providence also provided for his people remedies for sin after they were already redeemed. For we all falter and fall short of his commandment of innocence, even after baptism. Uh, quote number six in your handout. Nor would the infirmity and weakness of human frailty have any resource unless the divine mercy coming once more in aid should open some way of securing salvation by pointing out works of justice and mercy so that by almsgiving we may wash away whatever foulness we subsequently contract. End of quote. Please note uh, the Cyprian's understanding of the inner logic of salvation and almsgiving here. For Cyprian, far from almsgiving being a human work in danger of threatening or supplanting the exclusive divine work of salvation, it was God's own mercy and design that he provided for us this particular way out for the post-baptismal sins. Almsgiving and Jesus' death never compete with each other, and the former does not undermine the salvific significance or sufficiency of the latter. Both are the expressions of God's abundant grace, condescension, and providence, and it is only by God's grace that almsgiving can be meritorious and satisfactory in his sight. In this sense, almsgiving became the likeness of baptism because in baptism, remission of sins is granted once for all. However, the difference between baptism and almsgiving was that the former was non-repeatable for forgiveness of sins and formal entrance to the church, but almsgiving was not only repeatable, but it required constant and ceaseless labor for remission of sins and readmission to the church. In this way, a new historical situation presented a new theological application of redemptive almsgiving for Cyprian. Like Clement of Alexandria, Cyprian audaciously describes it as an economic transaction. Givers of alms are merchants of the heavenly grace, whose great gain is none other than eternal life in partnership with Christ. They make God their debtor, based on Proverbs 19.17. In proportion as Christ, Christians are rich, uh, rich in this world, they may become poor to God. If so, why would anyone amass their earthly patrimony for their own eternal punishment? Our God, in turn, will uh, uh, the rich who preserve their worldly wealth, while neglecting the want of the poor, sin gravely with their covetousness and can only expect etern eternal loss and punishment like the rich man in the Lucan Gospel, that is Luke 16, um, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. As a way to conclude, the early, uh, the early church proclaimed that Jesus Christ was a savior whose revelation of God, life on earth, and sacrifice on the cross provided his followers atonement for sin that began a life of faith through baptism. As a seal of salvation that brings about remission of sins, rebirth, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, baptism rather makes a marks a new beginning of a journey toward maturity and perfection in imitation of God, which requires constant vigilance, discipline, struggle against vices, and cultivation of virtues until the end. Salvation, which is always a continuum and a lifelong process and movement, would involve and demand a steady progress in taking off an old self and a putting of a new self, and a persistent cultivation of spiritual and ethical virtues in community. And this moral and spiritual advance and transformation entails both internal and external works of faith that would attest to one's faith in God. The Apostle Paul's words, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12, 
And what counts is faith working through love, Galatians 5, 6, were deeply ingrained in, uh, ingrained in early Christian psyche. Orthopraxy as well as orthodoxy was always a part and parcel of salvation, especially in the face of constantly lurking double threats of apostasy and heresy. We do well to remember that apostasy and heresy were judged not only by belief, but also by behavior. Indeed, early Christian authors are emphatic that just calling Christ Lord alone will not save one, but salvation has to be accompanied by keeping his commandments. Hence, Origen's scolding of those Christians whose works and moral virtues did not match their professed faith would represent a broad spectrum of the church. And I quote, for those, those Christians whose uh, good works don't match their professed faith, for those, our Lord Jesus certainly permits salvation, but their salvation itself, in a certain measure, does not escape a note of infamy. End of quote. In this divine economy salvation, God has graciously allowed himself to be approached through these works of faith, mainly almsgiving, as a fundamental testimony of one's commitment and repentance to God. Salvific faith must show itself in the world by Christians and carry external or visible form. Otherwise, it is not faith at all, as experienced uh, as expressed by Tertullian in particular. Although the changing context really shaped the particular application of this faith, as in case of both, Cyprian and Clement of Alexandria. We may not endorse all of these teachings at their face value. However, this understanding of salvation is not so much regression of Christian freedom and sola fide of later Protestant construction as articulating the intrinsic or intricate relation between spiritual and moral transformation and progress without which salvation is incomplete. The early church integrated both individual and corporate understanding and practice of wealth and poverty into the pastoral care of souls within the redemptive context. And almsgiving constituted a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God for dealing with post-baptismal sins. In words of Gary Anderson, alms are not so much a human work as they are in the index of one's underlying faith for those who are already in the journey of salvation through Christ's sacrifice. Thank you. Hey, we're going to have two respondents, as we said. First will be Dr. Noel from the Econ Business Department for about seven minutes, and then uh, Telford Work for about seven, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Good evening. My thanks to Professor Ree for the opportunity to discuss her stimulating paper. She raises noteworthy challenges to the wealthy believer, which are especially relevant for North American Christians, as we work and worship in a place in an era of affluence quite different from the experience of most Christians. Indeed, with some uh, notable exceptions, the vast majority of believers from the church's founding until the past two centuries lived at or just above the subsistence level alongside most of the rest of the world. And that's true for many Christians, of course, in the developing world today. Wrestling with the spiritual dangers of wealth was very often not a primary concern. In our modern era of relative affluence, many North American Christians must consider carefully anew the warnings about the spiritual hazards associated with wealth and our individual responsibilities to the marginalized of society. This paper clearly and ably assists us in that process. Dr. Rhee's thesis regarding the connection between almsgiving and salvation in the early church is grounded in examination of two patristic representatives, Clement of Alexandria and Cyprian of Carthage. She offers a helpful reading of Clement, who affirms that it's possible for the rich to be saved without dispossession and that poverty in itself has no spiritual merit. Salvation is seen as a journey, a path to perfection, and the wealthy can only successfully participate in this process through a non-discriminatory ongoing sharing of their possessions 
in fostering a friendship with the poor. In Cyprian's particular socioeconomic context, generous almsgiving by the lapsed wealthy would provide reparation for their guilt in participating in sacrifice to the gods or purchasing false certificates to that effect to avoid persecution. Dr. Rhee suggests a tension in early church, church teaching with regards to the nature of salvation. And she raises the prospect of a possible unfortunate trajectory being established of salvation through faith plus works in the patristic writers. This prospective pathway may be seen in the writings of Clement and Cyprian. Certainly they can be read that way, that they share the notion of almsgiving as a necessary act of repentance for post-baptismal sins and speak of continual charitable giving as part of the journey of salvation and making reparation for the guilt of sin. Yet, as she notes, we also find clear statements of salvation through faith in Christ's substitutionary atoning work alone in the patristic literature. I would add to her citation of Diogenes, the voices of Justin Martyr, Athanasius, Chrysostom, and Augustine, and others uh, in that regard. Professor Ree ultimately seeks to effect a reconciliation of these things, finding almsgiving and Jesus' atoning death to be complementary expressions of God's abundant grace. My sense is that this reconciliation um, is uh, a nice um, stab at it, but I think it needs to be expounded a little further, both in the primary patristic sources in the scriptures to be fully convincing. Otherwise, it strikes me that one might reasonably see the makings of an unfortunate trajectory here. For in the sermons and commentaries of Clement, Cyprian, and some other church fathers, who place a strong emphasis on baptism, penance, and almsgiving, one does seem to find the foundations of sacerdotalism, that is, salvation through participation in the sacraments. Down through a number of centuries, the requisite sacraments expand, and eventually, um, at some point, these will blossom into papal teaching on the need for human merit to be added to Christ's treasury of merit. Of course, that's obviously a number of centuries later, uh, roughly the 12th and 13th. In the economic realm, this is manifest in the medieval fashioning of the completion of salvation through participation in the offering of indulgences. Payment is to be received by the church to release one's family member from a lengthier stay in purgatory for one's sin is purged on the way, hopefully, to um, <coughs> uh, heaven, or one buys their outright release from purgatory. This is a practice, of course, which Martin Luther denounced in many of the actual 95 theses he nailed on the Wittenberg door in the early 16th century. Perhaps surprisingly, the current Pope Benedict has revived the proper practice, practice of indulgences for faithful Roman Catholics, though they're said to be grounded in the treasury of Christ's merit. I do think it's problematic as well to look for a thoroughgoing consistency in the soteriology of the church fathers, whether they hold to a view of the atonement that it's a ransom for um, sin paid to Satan, or for that matter, when you come to economic questions, if you consider several of the fathers, uh, second century Clement holds that common property would make people unnecessarily anxious about their physical security. We come to the fourth century Chrysostom affirms the economy of God provides for the communal sharing of goods. We looked at Tertullian, who is um, Clement's counterpart. Uh, he wants uh, to see Christians withdraw from trade and market activity. And it's also important, I think, to challenge some of their assertions, which uh, Professor Ree sort of hinted at, regarding almsgiving and spiritual sacrifice with respect to the claims of Scripture, particularly with respect to what Scripture does and does not affirm. For example, Cyprian particularly attaches to effectual prayer, the need for almsgiving, a linkage I think is, that's without scriptural foundation. We come to 1 Peter. The apostle Peter declares we're a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices, but he doesn't name almsgiving explicitly as such a sacrifice. And when later in his first letter, uh, Peter speaks of hospitable works, he doesn't name them as sacrifices acceptable to God to complement Christ's work, in accomplishing our salvation, but he rather sees them as manifestations of God's love in chapter 4, verse 8, through the actions of those he names as God's elect exiles in chapter 1, verse 2. That said, I really enjoyed reading this thoughtful paper. 
There are a number of issues Dr. Ree raises in a cogent manner, which are truly worthy of serious contemplation. Consider the theme of the necessity of caring for the poor as an evidence of salvation. Uh, and I recently reviewed a uh, work by a New Testament scholar, Bruce Longnecker, for the Journal of Markets and Morality. This book, Remember the Poor, Paul, Poverty, and the Greco-Roman World, carefully establishes that Paul's concern for the poor is not express, expressed simply as a one-time measure of collecting funds for the indigent in Jerusalem so as to resolve his tensions with the Jerusalem uh, church leadership. Instead, Longnecker's exegesis of Galatians 2.10 shows that Paul takes a more general prophetic stance toward the disadvantage. The apostles' position lines up with the teaching of the Hebrew Bible and Second Temple Judaism regarding the obligations of the wealthy toward those who lack the resources to flourish in Yahweh's world, as Dr. Ree has also noted. In Galatians, Paul particularly takes his stand against the Judaizers who affirm the necessity of circumcision. In doing so, they are influencing believers to depart from Jewish concern for the poor, by placing more emphasis on ritualized behavior. Paul spurns this requirement and instead calls for sustained, faithful action that is consistent with the conversion to the God of Israel. This is the thrust of his imperative to the Galatian church to remember the poor. And it's certainly echoed, as we've heard tonight, in the church fathers. I thank Dr. Ree for reminding modern affluent Christians of the great weight laid by the early church on the spiritual significance of ministry to the poor. Given that we're teaching a class together in an upcoming semester on the theology and economics of wealth and poverty, for you economics and business or religious studies majors, that's an unabashed plug. Um, uh, I look further to forward dialogue uh, with her about the patristics, scholastics, and the reformers, and the relationship between almsgiving and salvation. Professor Ree is certainly right to cite the idea that charitable giving to the poor is an element in the index of one's underlying faith. Indeed, I'm convinced she has an ally in this persuasion in the person of Luther. After all, the same Luther who preached justification by grace through faith alone also declared that we're saved by faith alone, but that faith is never alone. Thank you. Ancient theology, which is much less often than Helen does. I enter a world where some things are utterly familiar and others utterly alien. Helen provided us another such exposure with her analysis of Clement and Cyprian on almsgiving, and I'm very grateful for it and delighted at the chance to respond with observations and questions. I appreciate Helen's attention to matters such as the roles of historical context and social practice in shaping doctrine and vice versa, doctrine's role in shaping them, as well as the early church's widespread appreciation of the importance of genuine human activity to genuine Christian life. Almsgiving, obviously, among that, among it. These early Christian leaders are reading texts that we're familiar with. The church has many varied practices of sharing all through the New Testament. Jesus' assurance that what we give up, we will gain back a hundredfold, that's an exchange, plus eternal life. His offer to give worldly goods for, uh, to the poor in order to gain treasure in heaven. His advice to make friends with unrighteous mammon in order to enter everlasting habitations and to cough up the resources necessary for purchasing the precious pearl of God's kingdom. Detachment from mammon so that we aren't its servants. Jesus means something by these sayings, and it's not something we Protestants might be theologically prepared to appreciate. That's all the more reason for us to listen to the voices that do appreciate them, especially uh, ancient ones. I've tried to listen to those voices and wrestle with the theological significance of wealth myself. In fact, in a Paul Welt Memorial Lecture some years ago. And Helen's helpful. Have these authors appreciated these matters in just the right way, though? You said we might, at the end, you said you might not... Um, endorse everything they say on, it, on their face. Her analysis left me wanting to hear more concerning Roman Garrison's charge that these theologies of almsgiving represent a regression from apostolic soteriology that focused on the work of Christ to a focus on human work, or a shift from the exclusive role of Jesus' death 
as the unique and sufficient means of atonement to redemptive almsgiving for post-baptismal sin. Perhaps Garrison retrojects later Protestant orthodoxy on the apostolic church. But even if we make sure not to do that, Clement and Cyprian, as represented here, still seem like a move away from something essential in biblical faith. And I'd love to hear more from her on where these theologies of almsgiving do and don't misrepresent New Testament apostolic faith. She has read this material much more deeply than I have. This is how historical theologians end up besting systematic theologians, which they pretty much always do. <laughs> but I have some hunches about where the, uh, this early church theology received needed corrections, and I'd love to hear her response. One concerns the stark distinction between pre-baptismal atonement versus a post-baptismal work of response. Isn't this a shift away from the more uniform treatment of reconciliation in the New Testament? I can't read the New Testament as establishing that Jesus' sacrificial intercession merely carries us through baptism but not our subsequent lives. That's not the message of Hebrews, where Jesus lives to be our heavenly high priest forever. Or 1 John 2, in which Jesus is our advocate if we sin. Or the Lord's Prayer, in which we receive forgiveness measure for measure as we give forgiveness, not as we give alms. Ironically, such a stark distinction of pre-baptismal, or rather, baptismal forgiveness and post-baptismal reparation uh, undercuts our ability to apply to the lives of disciples Jesus' directions on giving, which he usually gives to aspiring disciples. The rich young man is not yet a follower. For Clement... Jesus' work is sacrificial atonement or rep ransom or something like it in baptism, but then something that sounds much more like uh, moral influence or example, which aids the passionless imitation of Christ after baptism. Well, isn't Jesus actually both in each moment? Do we not imitate his baptism? And do we not appropriate his sacrifice after it? Another point concerns the relationship between, theological jargon here, monergism and synergism. Monergism is the sole action of God on our behalf. Synergism is the mutual act of God and, uh, and us. All Orthodox Christian traditions posit a monergistic beginning for God's redemptive relationship to us. In other words, God makes the first move before we do which sooner or later leads to a synergistic relationship of cooperative grace. I mean, we're not still being carried on the sand uh, in, in the kingdom of God in the, after the resurrection. Catholics and Wesleyans have tended to sketch one set of versions of this process that, which begins monergistically and ends synergistically, uh, while Lutherans and Reformed have tended to sketch another, another and we fight about those, None of them, at least since the Reformation and the Council of Trent, none of them seems to have followed the use of merit as establishing a basis by which our prayers are heard. This is not how Catholics practice auricular confession or penance. You don't substantiate the basis for your prayer being heard. The priest forgives you, pronounces Christ's absolution, and then might give you some habits, some penance, to help keep things from going wrong next time. Um, nor is this how the other traditions practice confession and absolution or assurance of pardon in our church services. It seems that subsequent tradition has corrected the early church on this one and that Garrison's complaint even hits home. Even Origen noticed, as Helen notes there, that 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's uh, passage there, promises the salvation of Christians whose inferior works do not survive God's judgment. A third concerns almsgivings, almsgivings, earlier popularity in Judaism and its popularity elsewhere. Helen, do you think that here we're seeing acculturation, a poor contextualization of the gospel that involved a regression to Jewish convictions about almsgiving as justifying? In other words, the momentum of the earlier 
conviction might have just carried forward. Um, or, again, over-contextualization in the spiritualizing and internalizing disposition of much Greco-Roman philosophy, which then turns into the framework for Clement in which ongoing almsgiving becomes intelligible. Or another example, the pressing financial needs of the church in Carthage. On this matter, I've appreciated Tim Keller's insight that the parable of the prodigal son revolutionizes piety as well as impiety. It calls for us to repent not just of our sins, as the wayward son must, but also as our, of our righteousness, as the good son must. We have to repent of our righteousness. Jesus also directs us to regard ourselves as no more than unworthy servants, even after we've been faithful. And this could actually, uh, Clement's framework and Cyprian's framework, where uh, giving secures forgiveness of sins, maybe that gets the rich off too easy, too easily. Maybe giving is easier than real searching self-examination when you're rich. Think of the foundations that are established by billionaires. Um, calling God's permission to work for forgiveness, mercy, or grace. Calling God's permission to work for forgiveness stretches the meaning of grace and mercy out of recognition. And it certainly doesn't describe the way Jesus offers forgiveness to his own disciples after they sin and even deny him. And theology does often seem to decline in quality as the theologian's immediate need for church funds grows. Contextualization isn't always for the better. I don't mean these critiques to entail a rejection of synergism or historical contextualization or an ecclesial shape for salvation or almsgiving as appropriate and even necessary for uh, faithful Christian discipleship, and nor do I mean them to endorse only one particular interpretation of sola fide. These are all uh, positives that I want to appropriate from her talk. I agree with Helen that there is an intimate relation between spiritual and moral transformation and progress, without which salvation is incomplete. It seems to me that the Wesleyan tradition offers a pretty robust and orthodox Protestant synergism that doesn't suffer these weaknesses. With the Anabaptist tradition, maybe running second. It's nice to have the benefit of 1,400 years of further experience. Helen, as a church historian, has contributed to that tonight. Thank you again. Well, Helen, we'd like to invite you up if you would like to respond to uh, your respondents in any way, and then we'll open it up for any questions that the audience has. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Noor and Professor Work Telford, uh, for offering your uh, insightful reading and careful reading of my paper. Um, it is absolutely torturous for me to respond in a few minutes, so um, I will just have to kind of be selective. Um, so first. Uh, 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 Professor Knowles' comments on um, sacerdotalism, the salvation through the sac so sacramental salvation. Uh, it is that that is the case. That you, uh, eventually, that's how it will actually develop in the Middle Ages, but not so at this in the early stage. However, um, because once again. The understanding here of salvation as a continuum, that is almost universal. Uh, there's no, well, there is a beginning point of salvation, certainly, with God's grace, especially. Now, if we uh, borrow uh, Augustine's language with a preventing grace or prevenient grace, that is the beginning of his salvation, um, but the salvation never ends, in a sense, until our death, or later, uh, you know, or in the medieval times, until beyond our death, right, and uh, purgatory. So, um, um, given that uh, uh, understanding, again, the transfer of treasury, 
or the merits of trans same sex will be transferred to the sinners. Again, that is a very later sort of understanding medieval times uh, and very much removed from this particular sort of a situation. So um, I, I would say uh, it is a little sort of early to mention, at least in this context, until the 7th and 8th centuries, to mention this uh, sacramental salvation in that way. Um, now, uh, the, the sp almsgiving being the spiritual uh, sacrifice. Um, now, in Acts uh, chapter 10, uh, Cornelius in chapter 10, um, it mentions that while he was still a God fearer, right, uh, the, it, mentions, the, it mentions that the prayer, I mean, he was continuing the Jewish piety, that is, uh, prayer and almsgiving, and presumably fasting as well. And it was actually his almsgiving that was being memorialized, ascended into God. Because that's it's actually sacrificial language. Uh, so uh, given actually, the, again, the Jewish context. So it's mentioned twice. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, 10, 4, and um, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before the Lord, before God. And also uh, verse uh, 31, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Um, so, uh, and also in Jewish Apocrypha, as a matter of fact, um, both Cyprian uh, in particular, right, but also uh, Clement, they draw on this notion of redemptive almsgiving heavily from the Jewish Apocrypha, especially Tobit and Sirach. Uh, and that's where it actually specifically mentioned that uh, out of those three forms of Jewish piety, almsgiving is the highest, right, because it's most effectual in purging sin. Um, and of course, uh, you know that the um, early church, which used the Septuagint, right, uh, Septuagint was, in a sense, the Bible for early church. Um, including all those uh, apocryphal sort of uh, um, uh, texts. So um, the, the, uh, the New Testament, uh, well, as a collection, didn't actually come to the later times. I mean, at the most, the early second, early third century, excuse me, although there are individual pieces and some collections of Paul's letters are still sort of uh, uh, available in certain churches. So... Uh, Again, given the historical context, although I'm not necessarily trying to defend them, but it is understandable why they actually draw, drew their sources from um, their Bible, which was the Hebrew Bible uh, the, in Greek translation. Um, and as you all know, the, uh, that there is no, uh, until the Protestant Reformation, um, that um, that uh, the, what we call the, the Apocrypha was always part of the Christian Bible, in a sense. Um, now, um, now, with regard to Telfer's comments on um, monergy, uh, um, monergism and the synergism, the relation, uh, What Cyprian actually introduced uh, here is the language of merit, which will set the perhaps unfortunate trajectory in the medieval times. So um, the almsgiving meritorious based on, um, um, based on God's grace. Mm -hmm. But by using the, the word, the language of merit, it really rubs Protestants in the wrong way. Um, um, uh, so his point was not necessarily uh, highlighting almsgiving per se as the work of merit as to highlight Christ or God's grace that allows them, even though we might still say, well, it may be the, still the same thing. Um, 
But uh, what grace does, however, uh, grace enables for us enables us to do good work. That's the function of grace. Uh, Augustine, um, gra- grace changes the motive and directs our will to do good. Uh, in Caridian and other letters and so on. So grace is God's empowering presence as Golden Fee, or the New Testament scholar also actually mentions. So it is not only the unmerited favor, but it's also God's empowering presence that enables us to do good work, which is prepared for us uh, before the creation. Um, so uh, I really appreciated your comments. Certainly, I think among the Protestants, the Wesleyan uh, sort of a synthesis might be closest uh, to what the early church actually had to offer in this setting. Um, uh, and uh, note that the Wesley also actually drew heavily from uh, the church fathers on that regard. And so that's what really gave uh, Wesley the motivation, actually, to synthesize both, uh, you know, the, uh, the, quote, the Catholic elements and also the justification by faith alone. Um, and, of course, um, the faith uh, always works through love in Galatians 5, 6. So faith, um, even Luther, actually, as a matter of fact, Luther uh, uh, made um, the care of the poor uh, available for everyone. Uh, that is, Luther ca- secularized the care of the poor for everyone. So he actually took the care of the poor from the church uh, by, with his doctrine of justification by faith alone, which uh, should be practiced in the context of love in our creaturely existence, right, by virtue of our dual existence, that is, our salvation, vertical relationship with God, and the horizontal relationship with others and neighbors, right, we are inseparably um, uh, 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 responsible in a sense. Um, the, so, uh, so the cross relationship truly exists in Luther. So, Luther's doctrine of justification by uh, faith alone, uh, ironically, sets uh, the people uh, free, in a sense, or sets uh, the people free to actually be freely uh, give without, without the concern of being um, meritorious. Not sure whether, in terms of the time, maybe I should actually stop here and. Um, Please, questions.